Okay, I'd like to uh, convene the uh, Ways and Means Committee. We uh, have a uh, quorum uh, present, but uh, I'd like to introduce, uh, first off, uh, Laura Helgen, who uh, is joining our committee by having uh, worked uh, until they completed the policy uh, issues with the Education Policy uh, Committee. And so she will uh, be with us. And Laura, would you like to uh, introduce yourself, maybe give a little bit of your background? Yeah, um, thank you, Chair Carlson. Um, yes, I've been working with the Education Policy Committee. Um, and I suppose I, this is my first session, so it's been a whirlwind, and I look forward to working with Ways and Means. So thank you. OK, and welcome <laughs> aboard. Um, we, um, by way of um, background uh, for today, uh, we will um, be having the E-12 bill up uh, later uh, in the meeting. Um, we did do a switch there. Originally, we uh, had E-12 scheduled first, but um, due to some uh, other events uh, that are taking place, uh, the chair is tied up temporarily, so we will uh, have E-12 at the end of the agenda. That's the way it was published, but uh, uh, it had been uh, talked about earlier being first. So we will um, have, um, in addition to the uh, E-12 bill, we have four other bills that will be up. And this morning, we'll begin the process uh, that most of us have done before. We will be uh, combining uh, various uh, bills as they go forward, and the result of the way in which they're combined is uh, work between uh, House and Senate on the alignment of, of bills. The committee structures are uh, somewhat different between the House and Senate, and so uh, these motions that will be taking place later when we begin to uh, combine the bills, and in this case, uh, they, there will be three bills that will be combined into the jobs bill, and that's to better align uh, with the uh, Senate. So um, what we'll do is hear the, the bills, I will lay them over, and then we will incorporate them um, by motion uh, when we're done uh, hearing those four. And uh, then they have to, because there's tax implications, they will be re-referred to the tax committee, and that's true of the E-12 bill as well. So uh, these will not go directly to the floor, our work today, but will um, go, or will ultimately be re-referred. I should put it that way. They will be going to the floor for re-referral, uh, but they'll ultimately be going to the tax committee. So uh, with that, unless there are any questions about the process, um, we'll start with the approval of the minutes. And uh, Representative Olson? I move the minutes. Okay. Representative Olson uh, moves approval of the minutes. Uh, any discussion? Uh, seeing none, then uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, the first uh, bill up uh, this morning, then, uh, will be um, coming out of Representative uh, Palowski's committee, and it deals with um, uh, House File 7 by Representative Eklund. Uh, and uh, Representative Palowski, would you uh, care to move the division report? Mr. Chair, I move the division report. Okay, any uh, discussion on the division report? Uh, seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Um, and um, Representative uh, Eklund, would you like to move the bill? Morning, Mr. Chair. Members, um, uh, for, uh, I don't know if we want to do the amendment first, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you move, move the bill. Okay. Uh, we just I'm adopted the division report, and then we uh, move the bill. And um, Representative Eklund uh, moves uh, House File 7, uh, and uh, then we'll uh, take up the amendment, Representative Eklund. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I already buried my script, so I missed that part okay. of it. So I move House File uh, 7. Okay, that motion is uh, before us, and there is an amendment. Uh, Representative Pulowski, would you care to move the amendment? Yes, I amendment? move the A4 amendment, Mr. Chair. This amendment would uh, remove the uh, $15 million that Representative Lyman had uh, offered in the uh, Greater Minnesota Division, and that uh, would have restored the money that had not been uh, completely passed and signed into law by the governor last session. Uh, the, uh, 
the bipartisan support of the amendment in the bill uh, reflected the great support that broadband has. However, we now have a target and we need to make sure we fit the target. This amendment would put us in line with the target. Okay, the uh, motion is before us. Any uh, discussion? Yeah, it's close. Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Representative Eklund uh, on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, access to bro robust broadband is now recognized as a critical factor in the economic and social st sustainability of all Minnesota communities. And there are places in the state that still don't have it. This bill puts us on track to achieve the state's 20 22 goal of reaching every home and business with broadband service that can deliver speeds of at least 20 megabit megabits by 3 megabits Which is the FCC's minimum definition of broadband today It also paves the way toward the 2026 goal of a service that will meet the growing needs homes and business of homes and businesses across the state <coughs> This funding would continue the work from the first five years of the program which is a competitive matching fund grant program that works as a catalyst for public and private investments in broadband infrastructure in unserved and underserved areas of the state. While the state has put in $85 million over the last five years, that investment has attracted another $110 million in private and local matching funds. This bill is expected to attract similar matching resources to help in closing the gap. There are still 185,000 homes and businesses in Minnesota that do not have access to basic level of to a basic level of service. This bill will go a long ways towards getting that jobs done. And Mr. Chair, members, there's a couple handouts of facts and one from the Minnesota Chamber that's supporting this bill. And with that, I'll stand for questions. Okay. Any uh, discussion on House File Seven? Representative Krisha. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Eklund, for bringing this forward. Um, it's a good bill. Uh, one of the things I noticed. And I'm just curious about you didn't add any policy to that is uh, and I applaud you for that but any reason that and I, I know there's been lots of policy discussions out there is there any reason that you chose to leave that off Representative Eklund uh, Mr. Chair thank you Representative Krisha at the start of session we were talking about that and even last fall when we were working on this bill uh, prior to session coming in and uh, Senator Coran and I he's the chief author in, in the Senate decided that we'd work on try to work on policy for next year and just try to get a uh, broadband funding bill passed this year Thank you, and I, I certainly don't want to put words in your mouth, but uh, <coughs> would it be a fair statement to say that the program has worked exceptionally well to this point, and leaving policy off may even make it work better? Representative Eklund. Mr. Chair, Representative Krisha, I think that I think it has worked pretty good so far, and I'll leave it at that. How's that sound? That's perfect. Okay, any further uh, discussion? Representative Marianne. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, Representative Eklund, uh, just very quickly, uh, first of all, uh, really good bill. Thank you for working hard on this. I just want to tell a very quick story because I think members there's a tendency to think about as I look at this map uh, that you handed out which I think is quite stunning uh, for me. I, I just don't know how Minnesota um, <coughs> can play uh, the most effective role in, um, in the global economy uh, with this kind of coverage uh, across our state. Uh, but my quick story uh, for you is just how closely knitted we all are with one another. Um, so when I'm not here, I direct a nonprofit, and the treasurer of my nonprofit lives in Nobles County, which right here shows uh, less than 50% broadband uh, availability. Uh, when she took on the role uh, of our treasurer, it was a big concern for us because we meet uh, every month, every other month, depending on the schedule. It's a long drive uh, from Worthington uh, up here and back, particularly in the winter months. So we felt, you know, with modern technology, uh, we'll be able to, you know, have effective meetings. Well, she lives in a farm outside of, uh, of Worthington, and she says, well, maybe, you know, on a, on a good day, but probably not. And so she does do that drive quite regularly just to make sure that she's fulfilling her obligation to a statewide nonprofit that's located here um, in the Twin Cities. And so, you know, for members of, um, who think that this is just about, you know, helping greater Minnesota only, helping uh, uh, certain parts of the state only, this is about helping the entire state. Uh, we are uh, uh, incredibly interdependent on one another to build a good, strong society here and a good economy here. And uh, your legislation is going to help us do that. So thank you. Representative uh, Graffel. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't want to turn this into the broadband debate committee, but I want to correct my colleague, Representative Mariani, on one thing. You have this handout here, and it has a lot of pictures on it and shows the downloads and upload speeds. I want members to highlight one single word in the box on the very top, uh, right below where it says 2018 broadband availability in the state of Minnesota. Percentage of households served by wireline broadband, Representative Mariani, wire. So what this graph does is it excludes all fixed wireless, all cellular data, and all satellite connectivity in the state of Minnesota. That's what this graph does. Uh, the reality is every single Minnesotan, every single business in the state of Minnesota currently has access <coughs> to 25 download, three meg upload at least. Uh, the question is whether you count uh, you have to have a physical connection plugged into your facility or whether fixed wireless cellular data or satellite uh, qualify for that. So I'm not going to debate my colleagues on my side of the aisle or the other side of the aisle. I would simply point out that there, if you eliminate that wireline word there and you put in, a, just in access to the Internet and broadband, you end up with a vastly different chart. So thank you. Okay, any further uh, discussion? Representative Mariani. Well, Mr. Chair, and I, I, I guess I stand corrected, but my good friend, uh, uh, Representative Garofalo, I'll be sure to pass on the word to my treasurer that, that uh, she can very easily get access uh, to our meetings now with that information. Okay, any uh, further <laughs> discussion? Representative Skowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I will just uh, uh, help validate uh, Representative Garofalo's comments. Uh, at HughesNet, uh, I'm on their website right now, 25 megabits per second download and 3 megabits per second upload on every plan. A phone call, members, and you're there. Um, I just don't understand the legislature's uh, race to continue to dump money into this program that's unnecessary. Thank you. Any further uh, discussion? Well, seeing and then, oh, excuse me, um, Mr. Marks uh, has uh, some language that we need to, um, to include. Mr. Marks? Mr. Chair, members, I believe the intention was that these were to be one-time appropriations in, in uh, fiscal year 20 and, and in fiscal year 21. Uh, on line 1.9, after the word appropriation, uh, I would suggest adding is one time. Okay, uh, I will uh, make that... Uh, Motion. Uh, any discussion? Okay, seeing none, then uh, all those in favor of uh, the amendment uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, any further discussion on the bill? Uh, seeing none, then uh, I'll lay the uh, bill over uh, temporarily uh, as amended. And as some of you arrived uh, after we uh, convened, and uh, there will be motions later to combine um, this bill and a couple of others into the jobs bill as we proceed this morning. So thank you, Mr. Eklund, Representative Eklund. Um, we now have um, Representative Wagenius. Um, this will be uh, the Omnibus Energy and Climate uh, Finance Bill. So I'll give you a chance to get settled in at the table and um, Representative Wagenius, would you care to move the uh, division report? Yes. Um, I move uh, adoption of energy and climate finance uh, and policy division report for House File 1986. Okay. The uh, motion is uh, before us to adopt the division report. Any discussion? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, Representative Wagenius, care to move the bill? I would move that House File 18, 1986, uh, as amended, be recommended to be placed on the general register. Okay, the uh, motion is uh, before us, and uh, Representative Wagenius, uh, you have an author's amendment? I do. Uh, I have the author's amendment A22. It is a technical amendment, and okay. I would uh, move that amendment. The uh, motion is uh, before us to adopt the author's technical amendment. Uh, any discussion? Representative Garofalo. Thank you. Um, Representative Wagan, it looks like you're uh, deleting everything on page 7, lines 1 through 5. Can you just cover what it is that's deleting? Pardon? Um, you're moving the A22 amendment, is that correct? Yes. Um, looks like it's deleting some sections from the law, the bill. Can you just tell us what it is that's being deleted? 
Uh, Representative Wigenius. I am not understanding your question to me. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, maybe to Mr. Marks, the, we're moving the A22 amendment, is that correct, Mr. Chairman? That's the uh, amendment. Yeah, and it looks like what we're doing is we're deleting page seven, line one through line five. If we could just explain to members of the committee what it is that we're deleting. Um, Mr. Sullivan. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, the A22 amendment uh, what it does is it deletes language that isn't necessary. Uh, by default, money that's transferred to a dedicated account remains in that account until expended and does not cancel like a regular appropriation. And then the reservation of the grant amount, that happens um, automatically under Minnesota Statutes <coughs> Chapter 16A under the encumbrance process. Thank you. Okay, good question. Uh, Representative uh, Wagenius, uh, any further uh, discussion or comments by the author? Okay, seeing none, then all those in favor of the 822 amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, Representative Algenius, would you present the bill? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will. Uh, this is the Energy and Policy Finance Bill. It provides funding for the Public Utilities Commission, the, Metro, uh, the Petroleum Release Compensation Board, and the Division of Energy Resources section of the Department of Commerce. The general fund appropriations are all at the level that the governor requested. Our committee had $2 million above base spending. We used part of that to fund the governor's request to pay the legal bill incurred when North Dakota sued Minnesota over a portion of the 2007 Next Generation Energy Act. Uh, with the rest of the general fund money, uh, our committee provides uh, $600,000 for solar on schools that lie outside of the XL territory. You will see in our other bill that we provide funding for schools that lie within the XL territory. So uh, we'll, we can have a conversation about that later. Uh, funding for solar on schools continues in the tails. Uh, there are also appropriations for a cost-benefit analysis of storage. That's at $100,000. Electric vehicle charging stations outside of the XL service area, again, at $62,000. A plan for using prairie restorations for carbon sequestration at $8,000. Developing a strategy that would encourage public utilities to fund cost-effective conservation for residential properties. That's at 59,000. And finally, we are funding the U to tell us uh, what climate change, what the climate change impact will be on a three by three square mile uh, of Minnesota, all over Minnesota. Uh, we can't make good decisions about uh, infrastructure and other things. Uh, if we don't know what to anticipate, and that's at $547,000. And with that, um, that is the bill, and I would be glad to take questions. Okay, any uh, discussion? Representative Grappel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And then, uh, Mr. Chairman, <coughs> members, uh, Representative Guinness is correct that this is $2 million above base, uh, but there is more to the story. Uh, in this bill, you'll notice that there are increased assessments on ratepayers across the state of Minnesota. And in addition, uh, Representative Wagenius and the majority in the committee have decided that the money that's in the renewable development account, that they're going to change the statute and bypass the checks and balances that have been put in place uh, to make sure that people are applying for and going through a rigorous process to use the funds that are in the re uh, renewable development account. Uh, you will notice that specifically uh, the Prairie Island uh, Indian community, uh, their net zero project, which has been hailed as a nation leading worldwide a uh, leader for making zero emissions and is consistent with the environmental stances and history and heritage of the Prairie Island Indian community is funded at $5 million. Um, last session's uh, agreement in the omnibus bill and as well as Governor Dayton's recommendations, excuse me, Governor <coughs> Walls' recommendation uh, was to fully fund that project. And for some reason, uh, unbeknownst to me, I don't know why, um, the House DFL has decided that they are opposed to this project and would rather uh, engage in this other spending. So. For those reasons and others, Mr. Chairman, again, the damage being done to ratepayers 
uh, the spending that's involved, I would urge a no vote on this bill. Thank you. Representative Wagenius. Uh, first of all, the uh, appropriation to Prairie Island is not in this bill. It's in the next bill that I will be uh, offering to you. Okay, Mr. Chairman, that, that is these, these are two separate that's finance right. bills. That's right. So this is this is just the um, the assessments on ratepayers paying higher money now and. And fully funding the, let's the department's Let's talk allocation. about the assessments uh, for Brown. a moment. Uh, um, okay, Rep. Samoaginius. Uh, in um, several years ago, uh, you uh, decided that uh, you would not uh, assess the utilities for some of the duties that the commissioner uh, had in uh, working with other jurisdictions. And um, excuse me, still, uh, Representative Wagenius, so oh. we're getting the word that we're having difficulty. Yeah, if you could okay. pull the mic closer, thank you. Several years ago, uh, the appropriation, the assessment was taken away uh, from the Commissioner of Commerce uh, to work with other uh, jurisdictions. However, all the duties remained in statute. And so uh, we have just merely put that. Uh, uh, assessment back in, remove the sunset, and did so because the duties again remain. Any further uh, discussion? You see none. Um, we will uh, then uh, lay the uh, bill over um, as amended uh, temporarily for uh, inclusion in the uh, in the jobs bill. Uh, Oh, Representative Skowski, this guy thank, didn't see your hand. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just intrigued, and I'm trying to find the part in the bill that Representative Garofalo is talking about. Do we know what the additional tax in the bill is um, to the ratepayers that Representative Garofalo mentioned? Do we know the amount of that? Uh, Representative Wagenius? I, uh, yes, I believe it's 569000 I may be off a little bit, but that's roughly it. Thank you, Representative Grass. Uh, Representative Grass. Yeah, it's, it's uh, more than that. So. Oh, it does. Okay. So, now, uh, Representative Guinness, my understanding is that the, uh, the it's about a million dollars on one side of it, and then the uh, about a million and a half, isn't it? Um. Is there someone that, uh, Representative Wagenius, that... Or, or maybe our fiscal analyst can help you know, us with that. In fact, I'd like to, uh, as we move forward with these bills, if the fiscal analyst could uh, just come up to the table uh, so that they're there <coughs> to answer questions or house research. Mr. Chair, committee. Bob Eliff with house research. Um, the, uh, the section of the bill that Representative Garofalo is referring to is Section 1 of Article 2 on the bottom of page 5. And line, point, line 5.29 indicates that the uh, Department of Commerce may assess up to $500,000 per fiscal year. Representative Garofalo, did you? No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Any uh, further discussion? <coughs> Uh, seeing none, as I mentioned, then uh, I will uh, temporarily lay the bill over as amended for inclusion into the uh, jobs bill. Uh, Representative Wagenius, you also have the next uh, bill. I do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is uh, the omnibus. You all could just stay. <laughs> there are going to be more questions. Um, I move adoption of the Energy and Climate Finance and Policy Division Report for House File 1833. Okay, the uh, motion is uh, before us. Any uh, discussion? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Representative Wagenius? Uh, I move that House File 1833, as amended, be recommended to be placed on the general register. Okay, the uh, motion is uh, before us, and Representative uh, well, Guinea, yes, you have an amendment or two? I do have Amendment 37, and uh, if the committee would allow, I have an oral amendment to uh, A37. A37 is mainly a technical changes amendment, uh, but it does have uh, some ch uh, changes in level of spending. And we got a new update from our fiscal analyst uh, that we 
were over. Uh, and we got that update after the amendment was drafted. So I would like to orally amend, and I think this has hand, been handed out, that on line uh, 4.4, delete uh, 10 million and insert 8 million. And on line 4.6, delete 11.4 million and insert 10.4 million. Okay, the, uh, you can just incorporate that into your uh, I will. original amendment. Uh, so, uh, but uh, you do see what that uh, change is uh, that's been handed out. I think everybody received that. Um, any further comments uh, from someone getting us on the amendment? Okay, uh, any discussion? Um, Mr. Chairman. Representative Garofalo. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Leganius, are these general funds, or are they come, if they're not general funds, where are they, uh, what are these appropriations being financed by? These are RDF appropriations. Thank you. Okay, any further discussion on the uh, amendment? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, Representative Leganius on the bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, members. Um, this is the energy and climate policy omnibus bill. It is before you because it also spends funds in the renewable development account. It also contains policies that were designed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, including Governor Walz's one Minnesota plan to clean energy. I will briefly outline the policies we adopted and then go over the spending. Um, in our first hearing, uh, University of Minnesota professor Dr. Mark Seeley told us that Minnesota is experiencing the most profound changes uh, in the country due to climate change. He said the pace of change here is unprecedented and well documented by science. And he said he couldn't overstate the problem. The provisions in this bill continue efforts to reduce climate change gases in Minnesota. Specifically, uh, Governor Walz proposes to have all of our electricity generated by carbon-free resources by 2050. He proposes to strongly prefer efficiency and renewable energy when we need additional uh, electricity and raise the efficiency standards for investor-owned utilities. And as requested by the munis and co-ops, uh, the governor allows them to reduce efficiency goals and offer programs for switching from fossil fuel to electricity. Other policies in this bill include uh, extending the solar rewards program, updating the PACE program for large buildings, uh, utility cost recovery for innovative clean technology, a stretch building code, an emphasis on energy storage, and updates to the community solar program so that more individuals can participate. In the bill, and now uh, the money we're spending here is from the renewable de development count. It is uh, expended in with a little bit of exception, and Representative Garofalo uh, mentioned the Prairie Island. Uh, it is expended in the uh, service area of XL rate payers. So, this, so the, the things that I am listing are not general fund, but all from the renewable development account. There are grants from an account for solar on schools, at, that's at $16 million to the U of M and Minsku uh, for more rapid transition to renewable energy, and that's at $6 million each. To Met Council for the difference in price between a traditional uh, diesel bus and an electric one, uh, that's at the $8 million. And a grant for an electric uh, school bus demonstration project, and that's at a half a million. To Prairie Island uh, for renewable energy, that's at five million. Uh, for public uh, electric vehicle charging stations, this again is in the XL territory and does include for parks and for park and rides. That's 2.5 million. 
Uh, grants to encourage the purchase of electric vehicles, that's at PET 10.4. Uh, grants for low-income uh, community solar, that's at 2 million. And grants for uh, solar in state parks, and that's at 3.5 million. I just want to tell members here that in our um, in our committee, we had youth testifying, and they testified strongly that they wanted us to tackle uh, climate change so they could have the same kind of promising future uh, that our parents and grandparents gave to us. Um, this bill is for them. And with that, uh, members, I'd be glad to take questions. Okay, the bill is uh, before us. Any uh, questions, comments? Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Representative Wodinius, um, there are a lot of mandates in this, this bill, and I'm wondering if any cost analysis has been done to um, examine how much this is going to increase rates for the rate payer. Representative Wodinius. And which, what are you specifically talking about well, here? Because most of the money here is grants and uh, grants from the renewable development account and that should have no impact on ratepayers. So you may be getting into some policy issues here. Well, I guess that that would, Scott. thank you, Mr. Chair, and that would be what I'm asking about. There's some policy issues in this bill, and I'm just wondering, I've always thought that when we make policy changes that there needs to be a cost analysis to see if it's going to affect the ratepayer or not. And I'm just wondering if any cost analysis is done on any of the mandates and the policy changes that you've made in this bill. Well, if so, I can answer. Thank you. If you are talking about uh, mandates and the governor's uh, ma uh, mandate for, um, and that's probably what you're talking about, or that's what I'm guessing, uh, that is for us to be carbon free or for our electricity be, be carbon free uh, by uh, 2050. We had strong testimony in our committee uh, that the technology is already here and now uh, to get to 90% uh, of that. Um, and so there is a stretch in that. But we also had testimony that as we move to uh, renewables, prices go down. Uh, already wind <coughs> is the least expensive uh, form of new energy. Of course, conservation is always the best. Uh, but wind is the least expensive. We had uh, testimony that within five years, uh, solar will be cheaper than wind. So uh, we are actually looking at renewable energy that is less expensive than our traditional sources of energy. Representative Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so I evidently no cost analysis has been done. and. You know, if, if, if we can have, you know, so-called green energy at an affordable rate, um, you know, that doesn't cause rates to go through the roof, uh, you know, I'm all for it. But we also have to have reliability, and that's where we, we don't necessarily have that with wind and solar at this point. So at any rate, um, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that no cost analysis has been done and, on how this will affect the rate payers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, if I could. Uh, Representative Wagenius. In the governor's proposal for, for the 50, uh, uh, 2050 that you were talking about, um, <coughs> there are off-ramps uh, for utilities, and those off-ramps are for reliability and affordability. <coughs> hey, Representative Long. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I was going to speak to the affordability and reliability of renewable energy as well. Um, we had a renewable uh, energy standard that we set in 2007 of 25%. By 2025, that seemed pretty bold at the time. Uh, we met that eight years early last year, uh, and we did that in a way that was uh, affordable to ratepayers because, as the chair mentioned, wind energy is now the cheapest energy uh, in the state of Minnesota, and solar energy will be the cheapest in, in four to five years. So. Um, there's uh, every expectation that we can meet this affordably. In fact, we are right now. Uh, and to expand a little bit on the, the chair's statement on um, the report that was done, there was a McKnight Foundation report that modeled renewable energy only, not, not clean energy, which uh, would include a uh, carbon-free energy, which would include a number of more sources. 
uh, and the report found that 91 percent renewable energy by 2050 we could achieve at um, a uh, savings to ratepayers of about $1,200 per household while also increasing uh, Minnesota jobs because right now we're shipping $13 billion a year out of state to buy fuel when it would be much better to invest that in steel in state in terms of building uh, solar and wind and then that would create an additional 50,000 jobs uh, in our energy um, job mix here. So there, there has been uh, research done on the affordability and that was modeling renewable energy and this bill is much more flexible in terms of allowing um, clean energy, any, any uh, energy that doesn't produce carbon. Okay, Representative Skowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so a question for the author, uh, Representative Wagenius, um, you and Representative Long and others and in the majority seem to maintain that um, these renewable energies are going to be the most cost-effective forms of energy. It's been said that uh, wind energy is the cheapest now and uh, solar energy is going to be going to be uh, very cheap in four years of some sort. Why do we have a bill? We've got a bill full of mandates and spending and rebates and uh, uh, programs and government. Um, why do we need a bill if indeed this is true? Representative Wagenius. If you'll remember um, back to 2007, uh, when we did set a, a, a goal for Minnesota, it was a standard actually, not a goal. Um, that did spur people to think differently uh, than they had been doing before. That's when wind really got started in Minnesota. I mean, it did get started with the Prairie Island settlement, uh, but it moved along more rapidly. When you have goals, just like in a corporation, you work to their, toward those goals. And we worked toward them. We met them early, uh, as Representative Long mentioned, seven years early. Uh, that's what we're doing here. Uh, the spending is uh, on things that move us faster. Uh, we know from science has been telling us over and over again that we have 12 years uh, in which to move faster, to become, uh, to reduce climate change gases, or it is going to be, we're going to have even worse weather patterns than we thought. Um, I mean, the science is strong. It's pushing us hard. And what we are doing is trying to accelerate the process. And uh, that is what our youth testified to us again and again, saying, address this issue and address this with, um, with emphasis and a push so that our generation can have the same kind of promising future that our parents, yours and mine, uh, gave to us. So, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Long. Mr. Chair. Or, uh, Disco or Representative Juskowski, I thought you were done. Thank Go you. Ahead. No, I'm not. Um, so, Representative Wagenius, um, uh, it's, apparently it's not fast enough for you and so you want it to go faster and use the people's money to do it now let's focus on wind energy now it's been said that wind energy is already the cheapest energy we're already there so why do we have all these wind mandates and uh, wind subsidies and wind programs in the bill we don't have wind subsidies in the bill we if I could mr. chair if I could, Mr. Chair, respond. Reps, I get in. There are not wind subsidies in this bill. So, Mr. Chair, Representative Skalski. I, you know, I'm still reading the bill, Representative Wagenius. It's 80 pages, 80 pages of mandates, rebates, um, uh, subsidies, um, lots of programs. Um, many of them are. Things for storage and batteries and a uh, variety of other things. I, I just don't get it, Representative Wagenius. It sounds like the advocates are saying uh, we're already there. These are the best forms of energy. <coughs> it's glowing and wonderful and fluffy and feel good and we're going really well. Um, why do we have a bill and why are we spending all this money? This is other people's money, members. 
or something apparently that's not even necessary. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, Representative Long. Okay. Oh, he's okay. Any uh, further discussion? Um, Mr. Marks, I understand you've got some language that we may need to adopt. Mr. Chair and members, I believe on there's a should be another appropriation that's one uh, one time language in here. Really, the, the Prairie Island appropriations are in fiscal 20 and fiscal 21, but not intended to be built into a base for the future. And that would be on we take care on page 79, line 32. After the word appropriation, add is one time and. Okay, uh, the chair makes that uh, motion. Uh, Thank any you. discussion? Thank you. Seeing and then all those in the favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Um, any further discussion on the bill? Uh, seeing and then uh, at this time, uh, I will temporarily lie, lay over House File 1833 as amended uh, for uh, further inclusion into the uh, energy bill. And um, that bill is House File 2208. Representative Mahoney. <laughs> and perhaps for our convenience, yes, if we can have uh, the staff accompany you at the table. Um, as you're settled in, we got a couple of motions. Um, Representative Wilson. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move the adoption of the Jobs and Economic Development Finance Division Report for House File 2208. Okay, the motion is uh, before us. Any discussion? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. <laughs> aye. Right. Opposed? Motion carried. Representative Olson. Mr. Chair, I move that House File 2208, as amended, be recommended to be referred to the Tax Committee. Okay, the uh, motion is before us, and there are um, a, a couple of uh, amendments. Uh, would you like to take the amendments now before you explain the bill? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I might tr toss off the fiscal note a, a little bit, but we'll you'll just have to forgive us for that. Okay, if we get to, if we take the amendments, it gets in the order that uh, the bill is presented. So, Representative Olson, <laughs> would you care to move uh, Amendment A30? Yes, Mr. Chair, I move the A30 amendment. Okay, that uh, motion is uh, before us. Uh, Representative Mahoney, would you care to explain the amendment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is an author's amendment. It cleans up some language uh, that was missed, such as um, making sure that a uh, grant for Enterprise Minnesota is for Enterprise Minnesota. Um, it does change a number of the, uh, the base account. We found some money and we moved it into base, base funding. Um, deletes a couple of lines to clean up some of the language. Uh, makes a grant makes a grant to Women's Foundation of Minnesota uh, to create a internship program possible and include it. Um, line 18, just we actually had more money in a, uh, an appropriation or in, in their base than they needed, so we moved that. And a variety of other things like that in terms of from page. One, eight, one line 18 through uh, two point on page two line three or actually four and five um, we're just changing numbers to match up to what the bill actually does and says um, page two line six is again we're just inserting some extra language to allow some flexibility 2.7 eight and nine are all um, involved with the paid family leave uh, and then 2.10 and 2.11 just clean, uh, makes clear what has to be done with some uh, manufactured home um, language that we have in the bill from last year. Okay, and this is the uh, author's amendment then. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, Representative Mahoney, there is an amendment by Representative Eklund. Would you like to take that one now or explain the bill first? No, we, we may as well put that one in now, too. Okay, Representative Eklund. 
This would be the A32 amendment um, dealing with the OICs. Mr. Chair, I move the A32 amendment. Okay, the uh, motion is uh, before us. Um, Representative Eklund, any comments on the amendment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, uh, on line 14, page 14, line 7, delete $250,000 and, and insert $1 million. And on page 18, line 1, delete $6,689,000 and insert $5,939,000 and delete $6,688,000 and insert, insert $598,000. Okay, and uh, that motion is before us, and with those changes, the uh, bill is still within its uh, target, I assume. I, in fact, I know it is. I looked yep. at the amendment earlier. Okay, so, uh, Representative Mahoney, any uh, comments? Um, no, sir. Okay, any uh, discussion on the amendment? Representative oh, Scott. I'm sorry, not on, a, not on the amendment. Mm -hmm. no. Okay, any further discussion then on the amendment? Uh, seeing none, then all those in, figure, uh, in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, Representative, uh, I still got Representative Scott's name on the list. Mr. Chair, would okay. you like to go over the yeah, fiscal we, note? We, we've fiscal? got some names on the list, but I think they'll be on the bill. So if you could explain the bill, uh, Representative Mahoney, as amended. Would you care to do the fiscal piece to it, Mr. Chair, or am I going to do a lot of policy today? Uh, I think our focus should be on the fiscal, but I wouldn't be surprised if somebody doesn't have a question on policy. But uh, well, your main role is the fiscal part of it. So, well, Mr. Chair, I did not, I did not bring my policy notes with me, but I did bring my fiscal analyst, and from memory, I'll do the much as best as I can with the policy. I'm sure, you'll do just fine. Um, why don't we f focus on the fiscal part of the bill? Yeah, and I will have um, uh, my fiscal analyst explain that particular piece. You care to uh, get the uh, highlights of the fiscal part of the bill? Mr. Chair, members, uh, thank you. My name is Solveig Beckel. I'm with House Fiscal Analysis. If you have the spreadsheet in front of you, you should see that this bill funds uh, 10 different agencies. In the past, it was only six. So the additional four at the bottom um, management and budget, revenue, Supreme Court, and the Attorney General, those are in there um, because of House Files 5 and 6, um, which are respectively paid family leave and wage theft. If you look past the summaries for each of those accounts, you will then see the revenue section. There are a few items uh, in this bill that will bring revenue in for the state. This includes the Minnesota Investment Fund policy change, paid family and medical leave, wage theft prevention, and the unclaimed property system update for the Department of Commerce. Our target was 333,820,000, which you can see we have come to exactly. Um, then below this, uh, this is the detail of all of our appropriations. Um, we have funded a great deal of the items in the base. We have also worked to, um, or the committee also worked to fund uh, most of the governor's requests. Within community finance, uh, you can see that we have added a child care funding discretionary pool. Um, sorry, if you return to page one, you can also see we've added a business and community funding discretionary pool. Moving on to page two. On line 88, you can see we've provided a number of funding opportunities for nonprofit organizations that specifically address the opportunity gap. 
And we've also done the same with youth programming. The general support services has remained generally the same. Minnesota Trade Office, um, those had some operating increases. Uh, vocational rehabilitation services, the committee decided to add eight million per year, or excuse me, over the biennium. Um, state services for the blind stayed relatively the same. And then you can see paid family leave at the bottom and dairy assistance or dairy assistance investment relief initiative for the dairy farmers of the state. Underneath this, you will see the labor and industry department, which has items such as wage theft, earn sick and safe time, and paid family leave within that as well. The Mediation Services Bureau, um, the, they also received an operating increase, and so did the Public Employment Relations Board. Moving on to Commerce. Uh, you can see a few nonprofit organizations that the bill funds. Moving to page four. Um, under administrative services, the <coughs> bill funds the IT system modernization as well as the unclaimed property system modernization and policy. And it also includes the safe flight litigation. Under enforcement and market assurance, though the governor did rescind his uh, suggestion that uh, senior fraud prevention have continued funding, um, this bill includes that. Um, and then insurance stayed relatively the same with an operating increase. Underneath this, you can see the four additional agencies. Um, all funding paid family leave, earn sick and safe time, or wage theft prevention. The next part of the spreadsheet is all from the Workforce Development Fund. And this funds many of the same areas within the Department of Employment and Economic Development as the general fund funding did. If you turn to page five, you can see that we have another discretionary pool of funding for nonprofit organizations that seek to close the opportunity gap. Same with youth programs, um, more discretionary pools. And then I think the next chain, significant change is within labor and industry. Um, we increase funding for the youth skills training program and include helmets to hard hats. Uh, now, this is just the remaining funds from which jobs appropriates money directly. The remediation fund is for the contaminated cleanup. Uh, the workers' compensation fund essentially funds workers' compensation. Um, commerce has basically the same funding as in years past through the Workers' Compensation Fund. Uh, we fund the Court of Appeals through this as well. Uh, and then in Commerce, the Telecommunication Access Minnesota Fund, we, um, the bill does increase funding for the deaf, deafblind, and blind of hearing, or blind and hard of hearing. Um, and then finally, there are some changes within the special revenue fund uh, from some small policy changes that you can find within the bill, such as licensing solar contractors as residential contractors and the combative sports fee reduction. Um, with that, I believe I've covered all areas of the bill. So thank you. Okay. Are there uh, any uh, questions? And I think I've got three names on the list. Uh, we'll begin with Representative Scott. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, actually, my first question is to Chair Poppy, and I'm referring to uh, 25.1 and following of the bill. 
in its Dairy Assistance Investment Relief Initiative and its $10 million um, appropriation. And I'm just wondering if, if this bill was, um, well, first of all, is there a bill for this? And number two, was it heard in your committee? Uh, Representative Poppy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Scott. This is um, a, something that we've worked on to try to figure out how we would be able to support the dairy farmers in Minnesota. We don't have um, this kind of uh, funds available, these kinds of funds available within the um, ag budget. So to be able to bring this forward, um, we did hear a couple of versions of a bill. A um, couple of different bills to to figure out what we could do for dairy. Um, this was uh, kind of a um, a re re examination of what we could do to be able to put it in this in this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so I guess the answer would be that there wasn't a bill for this. And my understanding um, is that there are about thirty um, thirty areas of this bill, 30 pieces to this bill that were that were never heard in any committee. And one of the things that we heard at the beginning of session was that this new way of doing things was still going to be transparent. And I don't I don't see that I understand a couple of bills here and there, but 30 different pieces of legislation that are tucked into this bill that have never been heard before this committee. Um, if the le if if the Rep the Democrats are trying to say that they are transparent, that is almost laughable. Thirty pieces in this. How many pages of this bill? Two hundred and forty-two, and thirty. There's thirty bills or thirty um, areas of this bill that have never been heard in a single committee, and I find that really troubling. Um, it's not transparent to the public, and. I think that is a real black mark on this bill, and um, I don't know that I have anything else to say. It just it really, really bothers me that that much of this bill has not been heard prior to being here, and we're not going to get, you know, we could be here all day asking details over the 30, 30 um, pieces that haven't even been heard in another committee. Um, so I'm very troubled by that, Mr. Chair and, and Representative Mahoney. And I, I would hope that the rest of you would be as well. Thank you. And Scott, uh, how are you coming up with uh, 30? I, I have one that's on, the, um, on the list here, and that was heard in three or four committees. Um, so, Representative uh, Mahoney. <coughs> okay. Would, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll uh, back in to response to, uh, to that, uh, I have been friends with representative for a good number of years so I will put on my kind Tim Mahoney um, <laughs> act and say that again I think there might be one that was not heard that uh, came very very late and we'll have a hearing this week but otherwise these have all been heard in multiple committees uh, I have three, I have a number of policy committees that fall underneath the jobs and economic development area. They were heard there, and I took the division reports from them and put them into this bill without having a long, lengthy hearing in my committee, which was running out of time for the number of bills that were presented. I think we're at 3,000 or 4,000 bills being put into the committee, uh, into the process at this particular time. I think I did a wonderful job. A couple of them, or four of them, I think, at tops, uh, are governor's initiatives that the governor's commissioners went over in committee, not once, but twice in their presentations to the committee. So other than I believe that particular one that we'll be having a hearing, um, all of the bills, in, all the issues in this, com in this bill have been heard in a policy committee or in my committee. So I, I don't know where you come come up with that, but um, we all get to have our, our, our imagination. Representative Scott, I asked you uh, how yeah. you came right. up with the Right, thank you, and um, I appreciate that. And uh, this is a, a document put together by nonpartisan staff that outlines, and I, I stand corrected, some of them were heard in either um, labor or in commerce, but not in Representative Mahoney's committee, which is what this bill is um, centered around. But there are several on here that, that received zero hearings. 
Um, Greater Minnesota BDPI, which is the Sundin Bill, House File 1097, um, House File 2506, House File 2449, House File 1989, 2430, um, let's see, 2474, and I, I could go on. So, um, that's where the documentation came from. It wasn't something that we dreamt up. It was provided by nonpartisan staff. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Mahoney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, I'll stand by my statement that they were either heard in a policy committee multiple times um, uh, or gone over by the governor's staff in his present, their presentations. Um, uh, and again, without knowing what the bill, I don't have bill numbers in front of me. I don't know how to respond to those particular five. But again, I'll stand by my word that these bills were all heard in either a policy committee, explained by the governor's staff, or heard in my committee. Okay. Representative Davis. Oh, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. A couple questions here. First of all, more of a comment. This bill increases taxes or the biennium of about $1.6 billion, and we will dig deeper in that when this bill goes to tax committee, so I'm very happy it's going there. Um, on the amendment, I was a little slow. I probably should ask this uh, during the, when we're talking about the amendment, but uh, Chair Mahoney, on the amendment, what was adopted on page, on page 2, 2.7 through 2.9, there's something there that I got very excited about because it reduces taxes. And could you explain to me what we're doing there? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, that is all in the paid family leave. Um, we are reducing, actually, Mr. Chair, um, I can dig up some of that or ask fiscal, but I believe you're going to have the author of the paid family leave bill in front of you tomorrow. You might be better off asking her. Okay. Well, then I guess it's for something I don't support anyways, but that's, that's okay. Uh, but... Uh, very troubling, and you were right there with us in Commerce Committee when uh, Mr. Brickwitty, who's an, I think, assistant commissioner on the unclaimed property issue that's in the bill. Uh, that was very disturbing and troubling to the banks. Uh, we got a six-page letter on all the problems with letting non-Commerce Department, non-state employees into the bank books uh, with pretty much free reign. Um, and commis Assistant Commissioner Brickwitty said, and I'm just going to read a quote here, that the language was not a finished product and assured the committee that there would be continued work with the stakeholders. Uh, he said, consistent, let's see, the language, in, okay, let's see what we got up here. He said that, you know, they would work towards and only move forward consensus language, which what we heard in Commerce Committee obviously wasn't. I mean, that's probably the biggest money grab I've ever seen. Uh, that the Department of Commerce is trying to pull off here on the unclaimed property. It seems very innocuous, usually it's very uncontroversial. This is extremely controversial. The language in the bill is not consensus language and, and is unchanged from what we heard in committee. What happened? Where, where did Mr. Brickwitty's uh, words fall flat here? Mr. Chair, again, I didn't bring all my notes, um, but I don't believe Mr. Brickwitty's words fell flat. We took out data privacy issues. We're continuing to work on this particular issue and move it forward. Um, and by the time we come back from um, conference committee, I fully expect we will have um, a cons a consensus as much as we possibly can. But knowing that the banks can, uh, you can do everything to close down your account you can tell them, please close my account, stop this. And then when you look at your sheet over the weekend and you find that a major bank in this particular state over a year continues to take $30 a month after you've told them to close down your, sheet, your, your account, and they just say, oh, well, sorry, we did that. And by the way, we can't refund those $30 a month charge. I think the banks have bigger problems than to worry about unclaimed property that they continue to use for people, for investment purposes to earn money off of. And that seems to me to be the, the uh, 
just of this particular argument. They don't want to give up the money because they get to invest it and they get to earn money on it. I think at this particular time, giving them, uh, saying to them, and I take Mr. Breckwoody at his word, that he is working to come to consensus. They are best to have Mr. Brickwoody rather than me in this particular argument. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Chairman Mahoney, what you just talked about here has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. Is this payback to the bank? You're going to get them or something? It sure sounds like it. Um, third, well, charging Chair, $30. I have the floor, I believe. Mr. I know. Chairman. I'm just making sure he knows okay. you. Representative David. Well, the issue of somebody getting charged $30 a month on an account that was closed has nothing to do with the mm -hmm. unclean property. I'm very concerned about this because Assistant Commissioner Brickwood, he said that there was, oh, this would only move forward if there's a consensus. Looks to me like if it's an omnibus bill and it's going to the next place, it's moving forward. So here we have a bill that's moving forward that the department said would not move forward unless there was a consensus. So my question to my good friend, uh, Chair Mahoney, have the banks and the insurance companies signed off on the language that's in your bill? Mr. Chair. Representative Mahoney. The $30 charges were just something that were brought to my attention this particular weekend. So I think the changes that they have made and, uh, and negotiated already are, um, are good. And I am not using it as a get back at banks. Mr. Mr. Chair and Representative Davids, at this particular time, we all know that bills continue to move forward as negotiations are going. But the simple answer to your question is no. There is no consensus on this particular language. And um, for the state to do a better job I, uh, on, on unclaimed property, I am keeping this particular session, uh, section alive so they can continue to negotiate. Otherwise, I'll just pass this language and the banks will have to live with it. Well, Mr. Chairman, you can pass it all you want, but it's not going anywhere. So we can sit here and talk smart all day long. The $30 charge of something that just came out this weekend has nothing to do with the unclean property bill. Assistant Commissioner Brickwood, he said this would not move forward unless there was consensus. There is no consensus, so it's not moving forward. And good luck trying to get the language the way it is because that's dead on arrival. It's not going anywhere. So, yeah, anything passes the House. Anything passes the House. But... You know, as I never believed I'd say in my 27 years here, all I can say right now is thank God for the Senate. Because here's just another, I did say that on the record. Yes, you did. <laughs> oh, man. But You're in trouble with both caucuses. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have a great knack for that, Mr. Chairman. Uh, but uh, I am very concerned that nothing has changed. Well, some privacy stuff was taken on. I appreciate that. I do appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. But we don't have the consensus language on that, and we were assured in Commerce Committee, that's why I backed way off in Commerce Committee, say, well, it's, it's going to be taken care of before we see this again, and apparently it has not been. So a concern, and I appreciate your willingness, Mr. Chairman, to work on this in the future, but uh, if you go forward with the language uh, as is, you're going to hear a very loud thud when it hits the ground. Okay, we have several people that have uh, questions. Uh, Representative David's read in. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm just uh, two things. Just wondering, um, the uh, the individual, our uh, our uh, uh, my fiscal analyst. Fiscal analyst is. I, I don't catch if she was partisan or nonpartisan staff. <laughs> Depends on if you like the bill or not. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Draskowski, um, I work with House Fiscal Analysis, the nonpartisan fiscal. Staff. Okay. It Another way of putting it, she's in the same department as Mr. Marks. So okay. It sounded a little different in the presentation to me, so I, I thought I'd check in, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, Mr. Ch or, uh, uh, Representative Mahoney, the senior fraud prevention uh, item that's in the spreadsheet, is there, is there actually an effort to uh, reduce fraud in government? Is that what that is? Please tell me it is. Mr. Chair, yes. Um, Mr. Chair and Representative Mahoney, so what? What is? It's five hundred thousand, which is minuscule. But what? What is it? Um, Mr. Chair, um, from memory, it is a. Um, it's an effort 
through radio, print, um, and um, I believe they do a number of meetings with uh, seniors uh, to prevent, uh, unfortunately now our phones are owned by call centers and uh, you get a phone call from everybody and anybody talking about this investment or that investment uh, or you get a deal on TV or through the mail. Uh, it's an effort to educate uh, seniors to not fall for some of these, you know, I will put your roof on, just give me a down payment early and I'll be back in two months kind of stuff. And it goes from uh, investment opportunities as they call them to insurance to uh, selling annuities to construction to any number of different things. Thank you, Representative Mahoney. Mr. Chair. Um. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think someone's got to say something. That was uh, Rep Representative Draskowski. That was uh, that was kind of over the line, um, questioning staff in that way. I felt uh, I felt that was very inappropriate. If, if I could, Mr. Chair. Draskowski. Thank you. Um, uh, so. Um, Representative Mahoney, it sounds like it's not a government fraud protection or a fraud uh, prevention and remediation program. Um, this is this is looking at the private sector. Government's got the fraud and waste problem going on here, and uh, I don't see anything in the bill that addresses that. But uh, the word fraud caught my caught my eye, and I thought maybe there was hope, but uh, apparently uh, apparently there's not. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Chair, I would just say that I think. Uh, preventing our seniors that many of us around this table are or uh, are gonna, going to be soon is a really, really important piece to uh, the peace and security of our senior citizens. And I wholeheartedly uh, have increased this and I instructed the Commerce Division to actually do an even better job than they have done. And they've done a pretty good job so far. Okay, we have uh, Representative Hamilton next. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, Representative Mahoney, I'd also like to thank you for the Dairy Assistance uh, Investment Relief Program. Uh, with that said, I know we had this conversation in the Ag Committee where uh, our members, uh, specifically Representative Anderson said, uh, because of the dire straits of the dairy industry, we wish that we could do more within the Ag Committee and the Ag Committee budget, Mr. Chairman. And as uh, Chair Poppy pointed out, we have the smallest budget over in agriculture than any of the others. So. So we weren't able to. And when I read through this language, it talks about how this is a pass-through grant to the Department of Agriculture. And then there's language in here where the commissioner must work with the uh, ranking minority members of the legislative committees with jurisdiction over agriculture finance. So I think it's more of a statement than a question, Mr. Chairman. It would have been very helpful for the Ag Committee to have received these funds so that we could address this uh, within the Ag Committee. And I don't know if uh, Chair Mahoney would like to, to uh, speak to this at all, but, but again, I'm very grateful that uh, the language is there. Um, I do wish we could have uh, addressed this within the Ag Committee. Thank you. Mr. Chair, it's a, it's, a great, it's a great program, and I now have a cow with dairy written on it on my, on my desk. So I think it's great that it came through my committee. Uh, Representative Poppy, did you want to come in? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And just to clarify, House File 1418 was heard in the Ag Committee. It's a bill I'm carrying, and Representative Anderson had a similar bill. We've had, I think, three that we were talking about um, in the Ag Committee about uh, about dairy and about what we could do. Um, and um, certainly, uh, Speaker Hortman was aware of that, and I also spoke with Representative Mahoney um, because it was... Um, we were trying to find a way to be able to assist our dairy farmers. They are in dire need of some assistance um, at this point in time. And so, um, as I have mentioned in Ag Committee, I'm trying to search for money in many other um, pockets because we are in need and we'd like to be able to provide some support. And this is one area where we are um, strongly encouraged by this to be able to see some benefit. And I know that in the Senate, um, there is a small amount of money in the bill. Um, so I'm hoping that we can 
in the ag, ag bill, so I'm hoping that we can line something up and be able to provide some additional assistance. Our dairy farmers need us at this point in time, and I think uh, we need to provide what support we can. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Representative Hamilton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And to that point, uh, Representative Poppy, you're, you're absolutely right. And again, I want to I want to stress that I really appreciate your leadership on this. Uh, my point, because I struggled as the chair of agriculture as well, because of our budget is so small, it's very difficult for us within that ag committee and the, you know, the jurisdiction that we have to be able to address these issues that do affect agriculture. And so I, um, it's more of a blanket statement towards our leadership and yours um, as far as prioritizing prioritizing the, the needs in agriculture within the agriculture budget. So thank you, Mr. Chair. We have Representative. Mm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just wanted to make a comment uh, going back to the discussion about transparency because <clears throat> I um, heard some of the same refrain as we were marking up our HHS finance bill um, on Friday. And I just want to note that, first of all, we have this structure this year with subdivisions, and subdivisions um, did hear certain bills and passed along their reports to the larger divisions. And we checked very thoroughly with House Research and, and got all the advice we could, and, and those bills could be taken into the division the larger division without being heard again in the larger division, to hear them a second time really would be not very efficient. So um, there is that going on. Secondly, I just want to contrast, I, I, because I heard this refrain in the HHS Finance Committee, I just wanted to kind of talk about this because obviously it's a theme that's emerging here. Um, when the uh, Republicans were in charge of this body, I think in the two years ago, they actually came in and set up conference committees right out of the box. And then a lot of the bills seemed to be actually written in the conference committees. That is not transparency. What we're doing here, although, you know, these are big bills, the timelines are short, we get that. But these bills are going through committee. And when a bill comes from a subdivision, it comes to a division, it gets put in a division report, it has been heard. When new language is put in a, an omnibus bill and that bill is heard in a committee, that is getting a hearing. So yeah, we, it's, um, member, and it's getting a hearing where members can look at it, they can amend it if they choose, they can offer amendments to it, they can discuss it. So although we all would wish that we had more time to do all of these things, um, I do think that the complaint that this isn't transparency is kind of unfair and misplaced because we are not writing our bills in conference committee. We are writing them and putting them through committees and they are being heard. So I just really wanted to make that comment, Mr. Chair, because I think that this is gonna be something that is developing into a message and it's a very misplaced message because it just isn't the fact. Thank you. Uh, Representative Fischer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, Representative Mahoney, I'll start with the, the parts that I think are exceptionally well. The Article 4 Economic Development Policy, nice work. Um, one of the areas uh, that I especially like, uh, and, and you're focusing on workforce attraction, uh, which is very important, but the special education employment pilot projects, uh, very notable, and I just want to point out, uh, especially in many of the rural areas, this is a workforce that we need to tap into because we have people with different levels of ability, whether it's physical, mental, and they can actually, uh, if, if overcome and given the chance, they can become great workers, especially in our gigabyte economy. And so I want to call that out, and I hope that there's not, uh, one of the interesting things on that is there's been this back and forth on 1099 contractors on how they are incorporated and the definitions changed in the Family Medical Leave Act. And I would just caution you to be careful with that, because if we tinker with those definitions too much, we might actually be hurting those people that are coming out and could work at home and could be valuable contractors uh, for corporations around the country. So I just wanted to call that out. Uh, the other thing, that, but the part that I want to specifically go to, and I don't know, uh, Mr. Chair uh, Mahoney, if you want to take this or if you have a fiscal person, but there is a fiscal note uh, that came through the Commerce Department uh, and it's on House File 136, which became Article 9 of your bill, and that relate, relates to the net neutrality. 
Do you have someone? And I see that fiscal note that was put together for that house file is 488,000 over the biennium, and that survived through two committees. But then it looks like it was dropped, and I'm wondering what happened to that because I didn't see it on your spreadsheet. Was that absorbed, or is, can someone give me clarification? Um, I'm going to turn that over to my fiscal Thank you. staff. Mr. Chair, Representative, um, taking a look at the fiscal note, I think uh, what we came to in deciding not to put it on the spreadsheet um, was that it would be absorbed. Um, I can definitely do further research and get back to you, however. Thank you. Um, so I had heard that, and I'd heard that, and reading through some of the minutes and the testimony that uh, the De Commerce Department believes they could absorb this. However, it's a two, and I'm just, this is just something I need to understand. It's, a, it's two FTEs, so either the Commerce Department has two FTEs sitting around that can absorb this, and they're, they're not as taxed as we hear our department agencies all the time, or I wonder if we believe this isn't actually going to come to fruition. So no need to put it in the targets. Now, I don't know which one it is, and I, I'm not assuming any malintent. I just am trying to understand that gap because there's 500,000 moving through that we've said or that has said through this, we're not going to worry about it, which just makes me wonder. And so now I have some questions to that section, if I could. Mr. And these are more just inconsistencies, not necessarily. I, I, uh, I, would, I would put them for you, Mr. Chair, to consider as this bill moves forward, things to look at. In this, we've taken... Uh, what you've done is you've adopted Article 9, House File 136, which is the net neutrality section. Okay, so a big debate in the net neutrality. This is in district court. We're going to get a ruling on it. This is happening at the federal. You've chosen to put this in your bill. Uh, so we've chosen to regulate that here in Minnesota. A couple of interesting pieces, though. Um, the net neutrality speaks to, in concept, not allowing providers to discriminate, and I want to make sure I have this language, not allowing providers to discriminate on price and so forth. And in fact, we have Section 237 in law that says they can't do that. You can't treat people differently when you're providing the service. However, on lines 1.68 to uh, uh, line 1.6829 to one line, line 1.68.32, and I want to make sure I get this right, I believe we are exempting anybody that's got, that has received the broadband grant. Can someone verify that? Mr. Chair, uh, I know the author came to me and in the last committee, we put in language exempting the broadband, broadband uh, program people. I don't know whether it's past or future. Mm -hmm. um, I would leave that up to, you could certainly talk to Representative Stevenson um, I, again, I didn't bring all the policy notes that I had. Understood. So, Mr. Chair. So let me just raise my objections to this. So what we're saying is net neutrality is super important except to the broadband grant recipients. So we are now creating two tiers of regulatory environment, which is two more tiers that we've layered on to already what the feds are trying to do and all that. So that's problematic and inconsistent. Let me point out, uh, so essentially what we're doing is we're allowing, in fact, we're encouraging telecommunication providers who participate by successfully getting a grant through the state of Minnesota to discriminate their services to other providers or to their customers. So in other words, in theory, you could win the broadband grant and choose to do all sorts of the bad things that we don't allow through net neutrality. Now, I'm not saying they would, but we've created that climate. That's a problem. The other thing that I think, and this is why this whole section is problematic as well, on lines 1.68 to 1.3, or 1.6813 to 1.6816, is an amendment that went on in Commerce, which is actually a really good amendment, which allows internet service providers uh, to not be victims to retransmission fees. In other words, what happens is, a provider like ESPN 360 can come in and say, hey, we're going to charge you a subscription fee, and if one person has this in their network, everybody has to pay it. Okay, so now you take small providers that could be subject to thousands of dollars of, of, 
essentially retransmission extortion by a internet service provider, or I mean an ESPN, or I'll, I'll just throw this out there because this is a, a big problem, um, pornography providers. If you have somebody on your network who wants to view pornography, that, that, that service can force everybody on the network to be charged that or the provider pays that. This language allows providers to block that content so they're not extorted. However, if you win the broadband grant, you now lose that protection. So now what this language has done, and thank you Representative Eklund for agreeing or at least stating that the program's working pretty good, we shouldn't throw any more policy on it, because this is exactly the problem we're doing with this. Now, if I'm a provider and I win a grant, I'm exempt from net neutrality, which means if we accept the assumptions of net neutrality that people can throttle, I can now throttle, but oh, by the way, the uh, <coughs> pornography providers can extort me. We've really created a problem. I would, I would hope that you would look at this closely and maybe take Representative Eklund's suggestion and one that I agree with and say, let's work on policy next year and make sure we get this right and not try to rush this through here because this really is problematic, especially those of our areas in rural Minnesota that can benefit from the broadband uh, provider program. Mr. Chair, um, Mr. Chair, that amendment came after um, provider after provider showed up in my office and if it had only been the providers, I would not have given it so much um, consideration. But not only the providers showed up in my office, but the city officials showed up in my office, the economic development people showed up in my office, um, the business community showed up in my office, both urban and rural showed up in my office. Uh, lamenting how much trouble they were going to have with this particular uh, issue that 75 to 90 percent of, of America supports net neutrality. It just seems to be those that are profiting off of the internet don't support it. I put this in to, um, or I allowed it to co come into the bill so that um, we would quiet him down, but I guess I'll have to go back and lay out your argument that Put it back in. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, we have um, Representative Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first of all, uh, thank you to our nonpartisan staff for, as always, the exceptional job uh, you do. I want to compliment specifically uh, the Jobs and Economic Development staff, uh, something that you have a tradition. I know each department kind of lays out their spreadsheets a little bit differently, but something that the jobs area does very well is they separate out the direct appropriations from the revenue that is contained in the bill, uh, in addition showing the changes that are the house changes versus base. And I just, uh, had a privilege working with uh, staff for the last four years in this committee, and I just want to thank you again for your, your great work that you do. Um, and Representative Mahoney, Representative Davids mentioned this earlier, but line 24 of the spreadsheet, uh, we see uh, about $15.8 million of revenue, which is in addition to the money that you received in your target. Um, I believe you that you say that you're going to work on that unclaimed property revenue, but that's a that's right there. That's 13.7 million dollars of revenue, and as you know, um, sometimes three people in a corner decide to make these decisions. They don't understand the consequences of this. They just see spreadsheets on a, they see numbers on a spreadsheet, and I would um, highlight that for members of both parties as being exceptionally problematic revenue and exceptionally problematic language. Um, this is taking unclaimed property and using it to fund operations of the state of Minnesota. I know the chair of the committee is committed to fixing that, but just um, please don't let that authority slip through your hands to people that are higher up in the org chart. That's a problem. Um, so members, what we have here is we have a bill that is about $83 million above target plus the $16 million in revenue that's contained. That's a $99 million increase in a budget that works out to about a 40% increase versus uh, base funding. Uh, 250 to about 349 for total spending. And this is unsustainable spending, it's unsustainable growth. And I would highlight that at the very same time this extra money is being spent, I would question some of the priorities that are contained in the bill. There is unanimous agreement that the biggest issue we face in our economy regarding the Minnesota's economy with regards to employment is not a shortage of jobs, but rather a shortage of skilled workers. And at the very same time, there is universal recognition on this. The House DFL is insisting on spending tens of millions of dollars on the Job Creation Fund and the Minnesota Investment Fund. 
Uh, these are subsidies for job creation, which are completely the opposite of what we need right now, whether it's on a temporary or long-term basis. We need to be focusing the limited resources we have on the area of workforce development and workforce training, not on creating more jobs. At the same time this is happening, uh, we have seen, uh, my, my colleague from Rochester mentioned we're not going to see bills written in conference committee. And uh, yeah, you are. <laughs> you are going to see that. Uh, the House DFL made a choice. Uh, Governor Walls had a very left of center budget. Uh, Senate Republicans were going to come in where they were at, and the House DFL had a choice. They could come in in the middle, be the brokers who are going to decide this, uh, how this session is going to close up. But instead, you gave away that authority. You went to the far left. You went to the left of Governor Walls. And so now you've set up this massive chasm between uh, the left and the right. There is no center. There's no center negotiating partner. And you've given away your authority to negotiate as a separate entity. Uh, this is going to come back to haunt us. Now, those who have been around here know this. There's going to be a lot of money taken out of uh, Representative Liebling's Health Care Access Fund to increase funding for education. Uh, if anyone doubts that, then uh, I'll bet you $100. You can see me afterwards, and I'll make $100 off you. But let's be very clear that what we have here are spending increases financed by tax increases in an unsustainable fashion. Uh, the author uh, has a good heart on some issues. He has a Groffalo level of... Uh, controversial policy in his omnibus bill. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but Representative Mahoney, I do want to ask you one question. When the, uh, when the paid, uh, when the Halverson bill, House File 5, went through committee, I, my recollection is the fiscal note had this as about 400 additional full-time <coughs> employees in government to administer that program once it was phased in. And for you or nonpartisan staff, um, has that fiscal note changed? Is that still the same that the administration of this program is going to be roughly 400 additional uh, employees. Mr. Chair, I'll let my fiscal staff uh, look it up on the fiscal note, and then I'll make a couple of comments. Do you have it handy? <clears throat> Mr. Chair, Representative, uh, roughly 400 is correct. Um, this will only start in 2023. Um, so they anticipate 400 being the ongoing number of FTEs. Um, in 2020, it's 15, 21, 84, and 22, 319. Well, Mr. Chair, I, I did want to comment uh, to the dairy program uh, when Representative Hamilton was talking about a few years back. If they had had a more man malleable uh, chair, they might have been able to do a little bit more in, in, in um, the dairy farmers at that particular time, but just pick on them a little bit. Um, and the idea of having um, a level of uh, controversy, um, as my the former chair of this particular committee, um, jobs always has controversy, one way or the other. And to the uh, unclaimed property, that's the dollars that I used for the dairy program because um, it was supposed to come out of workforce development. Unfortunately, workforce development funds can't be used to build a roof or buy a cow. Um, the MIF and the job creation funds, um, I'm sure the governor will have more to say about that particular piece. Um, and I took this bill in a different route. I fully funded job training programs that are looking to do new and exciting things. Rather than train somebody for a $14 an hour job, to train people for a $22 or $24 an hour job. To actually get people out of poverty and live on their own with the dignity that that brings. And a couple of examples is, the biggest one is Summit Academy which is, with its new computer uh, training program. The other piece that I specifically worked into this particular bill was how, um, you know, I said it in my committee that none of us are pristine growing up. Some of us, through the luck of our legs being faster or our parents having better lawyers, um, um, we have no police record. If you have a police record in this state, your application goes into the circular file without help. Um, Better Futures 
Um, there's a number of, I've spent a lot of money in this bill helping men and women coming out of prison to get them a job, to get them back into society and into the workplace because we do have that workforce shortage. Um, and if I'm, without looking at the um, fiscal note, I think it's 15 this year, another 15 next year, and it hits that 400 number in 2023 when the, imp when the program is fully implemented uh, and it pays for itself out of that particular uh, fund and the charges that are in there. So, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, members of the committee, um, so we're talking about a 40% increase in the budget target for this committee on sustainable spending, 400 FTEs for one program. Keep in mind the paid leave mandate, that money is completely off the general fund books except for the FTEs. So the, the fees that employees and employers are going to be paying for that area, that growth of government's not even showing up in these numbers. And what you've done for the end of session is you've positioned yourself in a very difficult place to create a win-win. You've put it in a very difficult place to negotiate. You've put it in a very difficult spot to find a way to have a successful and timely conclusion to the session. So when it doesn't happen and the wheels fall off the cart, you should not be surprised. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Representative Mahoney, I believe you mentioned that on the um, unpaid claims uh, bill portion of this uh, omnibus that you removed the four pages regarding data practices. Is that correct? Mr. Chair, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I also see that um, there was supposed to be, I was looking back at the old bill, because this was scheduled twice to come to um, the Judiciary Committee, and twice it was on the agenda and twice taken off. And I'm just wondering, there was also supposed to be um, a judicial review, and I see that that's been eliminated as well. Is that correct to your, to your knowledge? Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Scott, I would have to go back and look at the notes to, to answer that particular question. I didn't bring that with me. Mr. Chair, thank you. And Representative Mahoney, um, why, were those, um, why were those articles removed, especially the data practices piece? Uh, Mr. Chair, um, I was advised by the Commerce Division that they could make this work without those particular um, uh, lines, of, of lines in the bill. Mr. Chair and Representative Mahoney, well, that's, that's kind of troubling because we're dealing with financial information. We're dealing with a third party administrator that this, a lot of these, um, you know, it says in the bill that you can hire this outside entity. There's going to be a lot of data sharing going back and forth um, with some very personal financial information, um, probably including people's social security numbers, um, their names, their addresses, all kinds of information that would make this right for identity fraud. And I just find that really um, troubling. And I hope that you would consider adding that, that portion back in. And I'm more than willing to help you with this stuff. But it's, it's really troubling that that was removed. And we're just letting government kind of go, go willy-nilly with people's financial, financial um, um, information and documents. Um, so I would hope that some of those oversight pieces would be put back into this bill um, because it's, it's really needed in this situation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Mariani. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, uh, uh, Chair Mahoney, you've already spoken about this, so I'll, I'll be really brief. I, I really do like um, the um, innovative approach that you've taken here um, in recognition that it's wise for the state to work with a number of, of broad groups across the state uh, that are working to develop the skills <clears throat> and knowledge of our uh, present and future workforce. Uh, this committee certainly heard um, uh, during the, um, uh, uh, the major budget, uh, state budget uh, projection presentations, just how vital uh, our workforce, our, our labor markets are, how tight they are, um, and as we look not too far down the road, the challenges that we face uh, with a uh, rapidly aging uh, workforce, which means we're going to have to increasingly depend on uh, a, a diverse uh, workforce as well as one uh, that's partly fueled by um, immigrants um, either migrating from other states or other parts of the world. And so I think what you've done is you've structured something here that uh, makes it possible for us to place a good bet 
um, on that emerging uh, workforce if we do certain things uh, with them in a very uh, competent way. And in order to do that, we've got to do it uh, through a diverse uh, delivery system. And um, in addition, you've done it in a way where we're able to um, not just depend on, uh, you know, who's our favorite group or the group that we've often worked with or, you know, uh, department work that we've often worked with, uh, but but we're, uh, we're looking for results. And so you have a combination of identifying uh, eligible diverse uh, 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 groups that can work with uh, uh, this emerging workforce uh, as well as some direct appropriations. And so I, I just applaud you for the, uh, you know, forward thinking uh, and an incredibly vital um, area of work. I know that a good chunk of this is going to be one time uh, funds, um, but obviously it's going to allow us to learn um, and hopefully continue to make those investments um, in the near future. Um, so I originally had a question with that, but I think I'd just use my time just to make that observation. I also uh, want to echo, uh, frankly, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Garofalo's acknowledgement of our nonpartisan House Research and, and Fiscal Staff uh, members. There were some unfortunate uh, 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 aspersions that were cast uh, uh, for our fiscal staff here. And the last thing I, I want is for that to have a chilling effect in the ability of this incredibly talented group of professionals uh, to, uh, to not bring the best of who they are, uh, you know, for the public and, for, and, and for obviously for members, but for the public, you should know uh, that we have an amazing group of professionals that work uh, in a nonpartisan way in house research and in their fiscal uh, our, our house fiscal staff, uh, there's second to none to no one, I would say, uh, across the nation. Uh, there have been times, certainly in the past, when I've uh, stepped over the line in conversations with some, and, and they'll quickly probably say, Mr. Chair, you know, I can't comment on that. Uh, uh, we are nonpartisan staff, so they're very, very conscious of that. And it's unfortunate that uh, some ex uh, um, um, aspersions were made uh, earlier today uh, from Representative Jaskowski's uh, questioning of staff. Um, hopefully we can put that down to sort of the heat of the moment, uh, but certainly not uh, put that down to any kind of validation uh, that our staff is nothing other than what they are, which is solid, uh, objective uh, professionals delivering good nonpartisan work uh, for the people of Minnesota. That, uh, that point's important to uh, remember. I pointed out at the time that uh, uh, they were nonpartisan staff, and you know these folks uh, do a very professional job for the viewing audience. Even though they're sitting at the table with the uh, chief author, uh, they provide our uh, what I call institutional memory, and uh, they work uh, very well for uh, members of both uh, caucuses and. Uh, my entire history with um, <coughs> our nonpartisan staff has been they have been truly just that, uh, nonpartisan. And so for the viewing audience and the people um, in the audience, uh, I think it's important to uh, understand their role. And um, they just do uh, an excellent job. When I said they were in um, Mr. Marx's uh, uh, department, uh, the entire department is very professional, as is the uh, department leadership. So I think it's important that we remember that. So thank you, Representative Mariani. Um, we uh, now have Representative Pulowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My comments are an observation on the discussion we're having about hearing members' bills. We have a fixation about hearing members' bills. We are at 2,824 bills, another record-setting pace. And the discussion here is whether this bill was heard or that bill was heard. It is physically impossible for a part-time legislature to hear 2,824 bills. We are not constitutionally mandated to hear members' bills. We are constitutionally mandated to pass a balanced budget. I would hope the budgets before us <coughs> reflect a thorough hearing of the accounts that each division is responsible 
for. Mr. Chair, when you chaired a division, I recall your hearings every day, almost of every week, on every account in certain areas. You almost never had a bill, but you had hearings on an account. And whether that account was adjusted up or down or flat, the hearing was on what would happen if we made those adjustments in those accounts. So the bills that we have before us, I hope, reflect a hearing on the accounts that were before those finance divisions. You've already heard a discussion that some of these accounts were heard in various committees. That's a valid effort by this body to understand what happens when we adjust an account. But if we're going to have a fixation about hearing 2,000 824 bills, and we are going to continue on a record pace of setting bill introductions, we'll never understand the constitutional responsibility of this body to pass a balanced budget. That is what we are constitutionally responsible for. We have had 16 special sessions in the last 21 years. <coughs> I think they reflect our inability to understand the budgets and what we need to do for the people of this state. So I would hope our discussion would be on the counts before us, and not on whether a bill was heard, but on whether we understand the account that is before us, and whether we're adjusting it up, down, or keeping it flat. Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. Good point. Uh, Scott. Um, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. And I wasn't in any way insinuating that we hear every bill that's introduced. <laughs> Heavens no. What I was insinuating is that we have a document from prepared by nonpartisan staff of a list of the bills that didn't receive hearings or didn't receive them in a proper way um, to then be included in the omnibus bill. That was my only point, Representative um, Pulowski. Um, there's no way that we can hear all the bills that are introduced, nor would we want to. But I think we do need to prioritize the ones that are going to be going in an omnibus bill, omnibus bill need to have a hearing in the correct um, committee or subcommittee. Thank you. Representative Pulaski. Mr. Chair, Representative Scott, my observation is on the entire discussion that we've had today. And the entire discussion that we have had and that is ongoing and it has been had over the last four weeks is on whether or not we're hearing members' bills. I hope we refocus the discussion on our constitutional responsibility to pass a balanced budget and that we understand in totality what happens when we make these adjustments. That is, I, that is the discussion I want to have and continue to have and that some of us were taught by the chair thoroughly day after day, sometimes five days a week, Mr. Chair, you had hearings. I recall them vividly, <coughs> all of them on accounts. And whether or not, and, and the purpose of it was twofold, and the chair was rather blunt with this. First of all, that we understand what we do here, so when we go in conference committee with the Senate, we're better than the Senate. We understand what happens with these accounts. And then finally, to make sure that when the bill is done, it is a bill that works for Minnesota. It is the best possible bill we could do in whatever the account was. That's the reason for my comments, Representative Scott. Okay, Representative Davids. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And the longer um, I sit and think about the unclaimed property, the more concerned I get. This doesn't just affect banks, but it's insurance companies, brokerage houses, and credit unions. This money grab by the department for $13 million from the elderly, the poor, and the widows, and the credit unions leaves the right thing to do is to have the department keep the word and not move this thing forward. That's what I was told. It would not be moved forward unless there was consensus. That's not what happened here. That's very, very concerning to me. So now, if the chairman does the right thing and gets rid of that piece, now we have a $13 million hole. So uh, I would just, uh, I've got some ideas on how to fill that, but uh, we'll just let it go with that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, I think that uh, completes the, at least the uh, list that I had of people who wanted to comment. Is there any further uh, discussion? Seeing none, then uh, <clears throat> we will um, begin the uh, series of uh, motions to uh, incorporate the uh, bills that were temporarily laid over earlier um, into the uh, jobs bill, as we refer to it, or House File 22. 
Oh, wait. <clears throat> Representative Eklund, would you like to move to incorporate the language contained in House File 7 as amended into House File 2208? I so move, Mr. Chair. Okay, the uh, motion uh, is before us, and uh, this will become, by virtue of the motion, a separate article within uh, House File uh, 2208. Uh, any discussion? Uh, seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion carried. Uh, Representative uh, Waginius, would you uh, like to move to incorporate the language contained in House File 1986 as amended into House File 2208 as a separate article? So moved, Mr. Chair. The motion is uh, before us. Any uh, discussion? Uh, seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. 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 Motion carried. Uh, Representative Waginius, would you care to move to incorporate the language contained in House File 1833 as amended into House File 22, or House File 2208 as a separate article? So moved, Mr. Chair. The motion is before us. Any discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion. No. no. Motion carried. Uh, we um, now uh, have House File uh, 2208 as amended before us. Uh, any final comments uh, before uh, Representative Olson renews her motion? Okay, seeing none, uh, Representative Olson. Mr. Chair, I move that House File 2208 as amended be referred to the Tax Committee and that the staff be directed to make technical corrections and amend the title. Okay, the uh, motion is uh, before us. Any discussion? Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Motion carried. Um, thank you. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chair and Committee. And I would like to again thank uh, the staff that uh, helped with uh, all of the VR articles that are now uh, contained in the bill uh, for their good work. And uh, <coughs> we now go to uh, the E12 uh, education uh, bill. Uh -huh. And uh, that's uh, House that. File 2400. No. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Chair. Representative uh, Davney, uh, we uh, need a, a motion to adopt the uh, division report. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move uh, adoption of the E12 Education Division Report for House File 2400. The, the uh, motion is before us. Any discussion? Good morning. Seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Um, Representative Davney. Uh, Mr. Chair, what I'd like to do, if I may, is go over a few highlights of the bill and then ask our very able uh, nonpartisan fiscal. Me, we need to, uh, that was adopting the division report. We now need to move the bill. Okay. Then, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move the House File 2400 uh, be before the committee with a recommendation to be referred to uh, the committee on taxes. Okay. The uh, motion is before us. Uh, we do have an amendment by. Uh, <clears throat> Representative Garofalo, would you like to wait on that, or would you like to take the amendment at this point? I think my preference would be to wait. Let's let's give members the full context to the bill, and then uh, I'm certainly open to consideration of the Garofalo amendment. Okay, that's, that's acceptable to that's the fine, chair. And it's fine, with Representative Garofalo. So if you could explain the bill. Certainly, let uh, Mr. Chair, if I could, I'd like to just go over a few of the highlights, and then ask our very able fiscal staff to uh, go into any detail that the committee finds uh, appropriate. Uh, Mr. Chair, House File 2400 uh, on the finance side increases pre-pupil funding uh, formula in Minnesota for all school districts by 3% this coming year and an additional 2% the following year. That's a $520 million increase in basic K-12 education funding for Minnesota schools. It addresses a number of uh, cost drivers that school districts are experiencing these days, making it difficult for them to plan uh, for stability in their programming and staffing. Those would be uh, particularly special education, the, the history of underfunding of special education needs. Uh, we propose in House File 2400 a $120 million increase in special education funding, uh, an increase in funding plus some changes in the formula to better uh, meet the needs of those districts experiencing some of the highest uh, increases in special education costs, as well as a $4.5 million increase in uh, to 
target these uh, cross-subsidy and English language learner funding. Uh, we increase early childhood scholarships by 16.2 million, uh, allowing more children to receive those services. Prioritize student and teacher needs, including academic and social support, staff development, full service community schools, uh, and strengthening uh, our teacher of color and American Indian uh, work. That is a, uh, excuse me, uh, $23.1 million increase targeting uh, making sure that there are more teachers of color and American Indian teachers in our schools so that our teacher core looks more like the students that they're teaching. Uh, we partner with community efforts for after school and summer programs uh, that are key to closing the achievement gap. Uh, we provide additional student supports in a variety of ways, including uh, improved breakfast, after, breakfast programs for hungry students, stu school support staff grants for more teachers, or excuse me, more counselors, social workers, school nurses, and others, as well as expanding the use of those funds. Six million dollars in grants for trauma-informed schools to better meet the needs of those uh, students. And to Representative Garofalo's uh, comments on the previous bill on workforce development, we include uh, building various bridges to the future for students through increased funding of both concurrent enrollment classes and uh, increased support for career and technical education. Mr. Chair, I would describe those as the highlights of the finance side of the bill. Okay, and uh, any um, discussion on the bill? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Chair Joachim, the uh, Education Policy did Chair, is also here. Yes, uh, I didn't know. Did you want to make a presentation uh, for any of the items in the bill? I can, or I can, Mr. Chair, I can, or I can just be here for questions if needed. That's what I what I assumed, but uh, you're welcome to make any comments that you'd like. Mr. Chair, all I would add was that we have included bills that regarding <laughs> special education paperwork, how teachers are licensed, tweaks to the board that does the licensing and ways to increase teachers of color in our classroom. There's legislation in here that would require increased training for our teachers and school staff around mental health, suicide prevention, dyslexia, and much more. Um, there's language in here around um, comprehensive sexual education and student press freedom. And the, most of the policy changes in here, many of them are non-controversial and are the best ways we best ways we can figure out how to deliver education to our students and there's a, a good balance in here of uh, legislation from MDE uh, Democrat and Republican members and yes we have heard all of the policy provisions that are in the bill in committee okay very good thank you and uh, our focus uh, hopefully will be mainly on the uh, fiscal side being mm -hmm. that this is the ways and means committee but uh, uh, we do sometimes um, have some questions that do surface uh, relative to policy that may be in the bill, so happy to have you here. Uh, Representative uh, Garofalo. Um, or did you want to wait until? Uh, Mr. Chairman, whenever the author okay, of the bill because Representative Drzkowski is on the list, so why don't we have the, a bit of the discussion first, then take your amendment. Thank you. Representative Drzkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a uh, question for the author. Uh, uh, Representative Davney, we continue. Uh, to chase the special education area around with more and more funding. Do we do anything to actually start to reduce mandates in special education, or do we just keep the mandates we have and build on more? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Draskowski, I'd actually hand that over to Chair Joachim, who uh, has a number of provisions in the bill related to special education paperwork. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Driskowski. We did incorporate almost all of the new ALM projects um, suggestions on reducing paperwork, whether it be making sure the functional and behavioral assessment could just be a smaller team, to um, leaving off assessments that are already included in other things, and many other provisions. In fact, I think we included all but one of their requests. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, uh, Representative Joachim, um, how much did that save us? And then the second question would be, um, and I'm, I haven't been on your committee or your committee, Mr. Chair and Madam Chair, um, but the, as I understand, the federal mandate level for special ed is here and our mandates are up here. Have we done anything to reduce the mandates so they start to come down? 
Two questions. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, Representative Draskowski, that's a conversation we're going to continue into next year when it's a full-fledged policy year. This year we focused on the New Ulm project and reducing the paperwork, and I would actually say our federal mandates are here and our mandates are about here. So we may have a differing opinion about how much difference we're over federal mandates, but that is definitely a discussion we're going to continue next year. We just ran out of time. Mr. Chair and, and Chair Joachim, how much did we save by the Paper Paperwork Reduction Act in your in, in the bill? Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Draskowski, there's a variety of numbers out there on that. We're really going to have to see um, how that fleshes out in the end, but the main goal of reducing the paperwork was actually reducing teacher load and making sure we still maintained um, transparency for parents and having them included in the process. Sounds like we don't have an answer, Mr. Chair. Thank you both. This, uh, Representative Skowski, is a, an issue that we've been working on for, quite frankly, several years. <coughs> Many of you may not know, but I used to chair the Education Committee and Senator Pogamiller and I at the time point, appointed a special task force to try to address the very issues that uh, you're raising. And uh, I remember uh, some of you may recall that I'm a retired teacher and I got back to school and I uh, was assigned to a special uh, committee by the principal uh, <coughs> with uh, the IEPs. And um, I was not a special ed teacher. I was mainstream. I had a lot of special ed students in my classes. But at any rate, his goal was to make me sensitive to the amount of paperwork <coughs> that was involved. And uh, there is an awful lot. And I am glad that it's a continuing effort uh, by the chair of the policy committee to continue to work on, on that issue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I'd, I'd just point out that uh, in the discussion of the previous bill, Representative Kresha made some, some very positive comments about uh, funding and, and programming in that bill to help bring uh, students with some significant, more significant disabilities uh, into the workforce. And I would suggest that Minnesota does well uh, with, by its special ed education students. There certainly is, is room to do more and better with any number of them, but we can't reduce services to the students in K-12 and expect them to take a, uh, the place they could in our workforce uh, at the same time. And right now we're facing a workforce shortage across the board. And uh, I think Representative Kresha was particularly uh, strong in his point that in greater Minnesota, uh, getting those students uh, to a place where they can, as uh, participate in the workforce to the extent uh, possible within their disabilities was key for the economic health of those communities. Thank you. Uh, and, and by the way, what my comments were addressing the paperwork per mm -hmm. se, uh, we also had discussions about uh, the various mandates and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, quite frankly, at the time, uh, we didn't have many that people were very interested in uh, removing because there was a purpose for those mandates being in place, whether we were talking federal or state. And of course, we had very little role uh, in terms of what the federal mandate was. Uh, I think my big disappointment on the federal side is that they've never, in the last half century or so, reached the point of the, uh, what was it, 40 percent, I think, mm -hmm. that they had agreed to fund. And I think during my time, the highest level was maybe 16, 17 percent. And many times it was quite a bit below that. I'm not sure what it is currently. Maybe you know that, uh, Representative Dabney. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I believe we're at about that same 16, 17 percent. Uh, this morning's Star Tribune has an editorial praising uh, the bipartisan work of Representative Stauber and Representative Craig on the federal level to try to move that uh, needle sum and try to position Minnesota as a leader in special education. I think that's uh, hopefully work we can all support. Okay, Representative Perkinson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the community of New Orleans has been mentioned a couple times in the conversation this morning, and I'd like to get, make a shout out to them. And also set them up as an example of what local efforts can accomplish uh, here at the state. Uh, that's a problem of paperwork in special ed has been one that we've been dealing with for a long time. I've heard about it from my retired, uh, my wife's a retired elementary teacher and her colleagues that work in special ed been complaining about paperwork seemingly for decades. Uh, this is a step in the right direction, and it's a step that we probably wouldn't have taken had not 
these local folks uh, made the concerted effort to put together a proposal that was realistic, uh, contained a number of uh, options that uh, most of which have been adopted by the chair, and I'd like to thank the chair for, uh, for hearing those out and, and putting them in her bill. Uh, but there's more work to be done uh, if we're going to get these folks properly educated and into the workforce. The teachers need to be spending time with the students, not with their paperwork. Okay, any further discussion? Uh, seeing then that, uh, let's take the uh, Representative Garofalo's uh, amendment. Representative Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Chairman uh, Dabney. So, members, what this is, is um, charter schools have a lottery requirement for those who are admitted as students. We do that because we don't want charter schools to create super schools where they're um, only recruiting from certain areas. Uh, we have different attendance policies based off of urban, suburban, and rural areas. This is a local issue to my district. Um, this, this bill does have bipartisan support, and it just involves Castle Rock Township, which is kind of on the edge of where a suburban school district and a rural school district are. It's a very unique situation where people who live by this charter school, <coughs> little ones can have, they can literally walk across the street to the school. If they don't win the lottery, then they have to go 30 to 35 minutes with the <coughs> other school. There's no local opposition to this, and I'm hoping that the chairs are they're not opposed to it, and um, the, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to characterize our conversations. I just want to say, please, I'll talk less if you accept the amendment. <laughs> Mr. Chair, that makes strong by <laughs> yeah, yeah. last comment. But uh, you know, I think to um, actually have some action on it, you probably should move the amendment. Mr. Chairman, I would move the A33 amendment. Okay, the amendment uh, is before us, and it's already been explained. Uh, Representative uh, Davney or Representative Joachim, who wants to comment? Mr. Chair, um, I'm, I'm just wondering if I speak positively, positively to the amendment, do I get to choose when Representative Garofalo talks less? <laughs> or, uh, uh, members, uh, if you look on the amendment on lines 2.1 to 2.3, there's a similar uh, statute already for uh, impacting a different charter school. Um, I have no opposition to this. I'll leave it to the committee to uh, act on it. Yeah, and when Representative Graffalo talked to me, I think that uh, other district we did that for uh, was uh, in the Duluth area. Mm -hmm. if I That's correct. Our conversation. Um, any uh, discussion on the? Oh, um, Mr. Chair, I would just um, I would just add. I'm, I'm agnostic on it. We just ran out of time to hear this bill, and I believe Representative Daniels has a similar bill. My only concern is we didn't have any testimony on it, and the charter school wasn't able to come down and speak on it. So I, I, I will leave it up to the committee. Okay, uh, any uh, further discussion? Uh, seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Um, <clears throat> any further uh, discussion on the bill? Uh, Representative Davney uh, or uh, Representative Joachim, any uh, concluding comments? It's a good bill. It's actually, it's a very good bill. We didn't request that it to be so short, but that was directed at someone else. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> um, <coughs> so, uh, Representative Davney, would you care to renew your motion? I would, Mr. Chair. I'd, uh, renew my motion that House File 2400, as amended, be recommended. Uh, to pass and referred to the tax committee. Okay, the uh, motion uh, is uh, before us. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none then, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair and members. I'd like to uh, thank members, and this is going to be a very uh, busy uh, week. And what time do we start tomorrow? Tomorrow is a different start time. Uh, I was reminded uh, by Ms. Conley that uh, 12.30 will be our start time. Uh, Representative Garofalo and I had a bit of a uh, short discussion. Uh, we may have to hang a little bit loose about Thursday. There's the potential for a huge storm moving in, and that may uh, influence our uh, start time and what have you on Thursday. Uh, this morning on the news, they were saying that the Twin Cities was in line. Uh, they said that that could be adjusted in the next 24 hours. So uh, we'll just have to play it by ear relative to Thursday. But it starts Wednesday night. It's hard to believe a nice day out there today. Uh, my birthday is in April. <laughs> and uh, when I was in elementary school, I convinced my mother 
to allow me to invite everybody in my class, plus some in the neighborhood, for my birthday party. And we had a storm, like they're talking about, might come Thursday, and we lived in a tiny house in South Minneapolis. And my mother, you know, five children, she was one that uh, could just kind of hang loose with most anything. So we did have the birthday party, but my grandfather and my father had set up a tent in the backyard, and it was weather like this, and then we had that blizzard. So um, my mother's no longer with us, but I still have to thank her for enduring all of that with all those little kids in that tiny little house. But uh, thank you, and with that, uh, meeting adjourned.